Good morning. Um, I'm Mr. Buck and I'm one of the cardiothoracic surgeons here in Aberdeen. And I have with me this morning Emeka Kesiemi, who's one of our specialist registrars in cardiothoracic surgery, and Armand Preet, who's a fifth year medical student. And we are going to be recording this little tutorial on heart valves uh, and I hope, we hope you find it interesting. So I brought along some heart valves uh, to show you how they have evolved over the decades. And the first heart valve to come into widespread use was this ball and cage valve. So the ball and cage valve is called the Star Edwards valve. And it went through a variety of modifications, including it one, one which had a metal ball which ran along special tracks. And it was, it was famous for being the loudest artificial heart valve to ever be created. Apparently you could hear the patient coming at 20 yards, but uh, the, fin the final version of it was this, this type which has a rubber ball. And occasionally when we sew these valves into the aortic valve annulus, there, there's a leak on the valve between the valve sewing ring and the aortic valve annulus. And that's called a paravalvular leak or paravalvular aortic regurgitation. And this uh, valve was quite popular with surgeons because it has the ability to pop the valve out like this, the ball can come out like this, which meant that we could put an extra stitch in quite easily to the leak and then reinsert the ball and it would work perfectly well. These valves can last for a very long time. They're no longer implanted uh, at the present time, uh, in the UK at least, but they are still quite popular in India and other parts of the world. And there are still many patients around who have these ball and cage valves. The problem with them was that they are called lateral flow valves because the blood has to move forwards then to the side and then forwards again. So they had quite high gradients. So it wasn't always a, a good regression of left ventricular hypertrophy after they were put in. The heart still had to work quite hard to pump the blood out of the left ventricle. They also required a lot of uh, anticoagulation because there was considerable turbulence in the flow jets as it did this uh, strange multi-directional uh, flow path. So the INR targets for these valves were in the region of three to four. So you still see that in old textbooks when it talks about uh, target, target INR ranges for mechanical heart valves. And in some cases they were referring to this valve. So I'll give the valve to Armand Preet to have a look at while I tell you about the next one. Uh, so following the ball and cage valves, there was a desire to try and make the flow of blood out of the heart more central and less turbulent in the hope that this would give rise to lower gradients and uh, the need for lower anticoagulation targets. So the tilting disc valve was then invented and uh, these have one pyrolytic carbon disc which opens and closes uh, with the cardiac cycle. And these did achieve the objectives. They were, they were better than the Star Edwards valve uh, in that they, the, the gradients were less and the need for anticoagulation was lower. And so these, are, these would have an anticoagulation target of two to three. And they, they were very successful for a time the problem was that in some patients, valve thrombosis would occur. And if the entire disc gets stuck, then, then it's very serious. The patient becomes very unwell or dies. And there was also a special uh, valve of this type, which was had manufacturing design faults. And what happened was that the disc would escape. And this also led to sudden death or, or at least the patient becoming very unwell. And uh, there was a big program in the 1990s to offer patients who had that valve in place uh, the chance to come in and have a redo operation to, to remove the valve and put a, a new one in that didn't have that problem. So uh, the tilting disc valves are also quite noisy. They make a, a loud noise, not quite as bad as when a, a Star Edwards had a metal ball, but nonetheless they do. Um, this was an adverse feature for many patients. Just in passing, you, you can see these two valves, uh, which are both tilting disc valves, and the one is much smaller than the other one. So typically this would be the average size of an aortic valve, and this would be the average size of a mitral valve. So a mitral valve is a, a bigger valve than the aortic valve in the normal human heart. So I'll give that to Armand Preet to have a look at, and I'll move on to the next type of valve, which is also a mechanical heart valve, with pyrolytic discs, pyrolytic carbon, but this valve has two leaflets. So it's rather like the, the, the gates of a canal lock uh, 
and uh, they, they, they open and close. It has the advantage, again, of central flow, uh, low gradients, low INR targets. And it also has the advantage that if one of the leaflets gets stuck, the patient will still be alive. They may be breathless and have some signs of heart failure, but they it won't be the catastrophic event that would happen if a single disc valve obstructed. So these are now the standard type of mechanical valve that we implant. And these are usually delivered intraoperatively on a delivery system like this, uh, as all the valves would be. And the idea is to keep the assistant's fingers away from the surgeon's needle as he's passing the needle through the sewing ring. All artificial heart valves have a cloth uh, ring which allows the stitches to be placed, which will anchor the valve into place uh, within the cardiac structure, within the annulus of the valve. We sometimes find once the valve has been placed that there's impingement on a, a nodule of scar tissue within the heart or against a muscle band, and we may have to rotate the valve. So these valves all come with the ability to, to be rotated, and uh, we, we can use the, the valve delivery system comes with a rotating gadget at the end, which can be inserted into the valve and then turned to obtain the satisfactory position where the leaflets open and close uh, quite normally. I just was wondering how often does the leaflet get stuck um, in your practice? Well, it's actually very rare for it to get stuck, but it can happen if the patient stops taking their warfarin. But actually, it doesn't cause a problem in 90% of them. But um, there is a percentage of them, perhaps 10 or 20%, in whom the valve will thrombose. Uh, we can also find that after 10 or 20 years, we get tissue ingrowth called panis, which forms a sort of a rim of scar tissue around the orifice of the valve, and that impinges on the valve and stops it opening and closing properly. Or, and it can lead to the valve becoming stuck behind the ridge of fibrous tissue. Less of a problem in the bileaflet valves, but it was a big problem in the single disc valves. But that can still lead to malfunction of one of the leaflets and lead to the need for reoperation. Obviously, if you have one of these valves in the tricuspid position, then you cannot put a pacing lead through it because uh, it would interfere with the function of the valve. It would be absolutely contraindicated and they would need to have an epicardial pacemaker implanted. Now, when in the realm of heart valve replacement, the mechanical valves represent about 20% of valves that are put in. 80% of valves which are put in are actually biological valves. So these are not mechanical. They do not require warfarin in themselves. The patient may need warfarin for other reasons, but uh, these patient, these uh, valves are, are from a pig heart. They are pig aortic valves, and they have been mounted on a special frame which mimics the natural wall of the aorta and the, the commissures of the aortic valve. Uh, you can see it has the typical Mercedes-Benz sign of the tri-leaflet uh, aorto, aortic and pulmonary valves. So these are the popular valves that are put in nowadays. They have the advantage over the mechanical valves that they do not require warfarin. And for many older patients, that's a big advantage. As we get older, we develop other diseases, which uh, it can be a great disadvantage to be on warfarin. Or the patients may require surgery. And then, then of course, you have to stop warfarin if you have a mechanical valve. But you wouldn't have that problem with a biological valve. Biological valves have, have the disadvantage compared to mechanical valves of them lasting about 15 years for the aortic position and about 10 years for the mitral position on average. So they do wait out and uh, this means that the, the patients may require a second operation. So uh, we in general would recommend the mechanical valve to someone below the age of 55 and the, the pig valve to someone over the age of 55. That has changed. It used to be 65 would be the, the cutoff in, in the age for choosing which valve. But now we have special valves that can be delivered down a wire, trans arterial valves or TAVI, uh, which can be put into a degenerated pig valve. And so this gives the patient another 10 years of, of uh, a good valve function before the TAVI valve can be expected to fail as well. So these are the biological valves and I hope I've been able to demonstrate the, the anatomy of it. In patients where the valve is regurgitant, then we have the option to 
not replace the valve, but to repair the valve. And this involves tightening up the annulus, annuloplasty we call it. So the annulus is that part of the heart where the valve leaflets are inserted into the wall of the heart. And uh, that generally has to be tightened up so as to improve the either mitral, tricuspid, aortic, pulmonary regurgitation. And most commonly in adult practice that involves doing annuloplasty of the mitral valve. So we have these uh, rings which don't have a valve mechanism within them and they are just cloth rings and they they can be inserted around the valve annulus and so as to tighten it up and improve the coaptation of the, the leaflet. For the tricuspid valve the annuloplasty ring has a gap in it and that's because the bundle of hiss runs through the tricuspid annulus so the gap is where the bundle of hiss is so that we don't cause complete heart block by inserting it. In the case of the aortic valve the valve can be sometimes repaired if the pathology is one of aortic aneurysm. So in an aortic aneurysm, you may get splaying of the commissures of the aortic valve. When the commissures are splayed open by the aortic aneurysm, it can lead to the leaflets no longer meeting centrally in diastole and you get central aortic regurgitation. So when we replace the ascending aorta, and we would use a, a piece of graft material similar to this. Obviously, this is not the right size for this valve, but we would choose a size that was the right size. And uh, when the valve commissures are brought back to their normal position by the graft, then this can restore aortic regurgitation. And it's a good solution for that particular type of aortic regurgitation. One of the problems we sometimes face with putting our valve into the heart is that the natural orifice of the valve is dysplastic, which means that it's too small to take the valve. And we may then have to surgically enlarge the valve annulus. And uh, in the case of the aorta, we call that an aortic root enlargement. And that involves cutting down through the annulus of the valve, generally into the anterior mitral valve leaflet, and inserting a patch of bovine pericardium. That's the most commonly used method of enlarging the aortic root so as to get an adequate size of valve in into the patient. If we have an average adult and we put a size 17 valve into them, uh, it won't do them much good. They'll still be left with at least moderate aortic stenosis, which is a kind of iatrogenic aortic stenosis. So we uh, do like to make sure they have a valve that's going to lead to regression of the left ventricular hypertrophy that they generally have in aortic valve disease. We don't enlarge the mitral valve annulus. It's quite difficult to enlarge the mitral valve annulus because there are various blood vessels uh, in relation to it, principally the circumflex coronary artery and the coronary sinus, and, and above it lies the aortic valve. So it's quite tricky to enlarge the mitral valve annulus. There are ways of doing it, but they're quite complicated and they involve replacing the aortic valve as well. Because if you're going to enlarge the mitral valve annulus, you have to do so by uh, removing the, the aortic valve and the mitral valve and cutting a, a portion of tissue that we call the aortomitral continuity out and replacing it with a sheet of fibrous tissue. And it's called the commando procedure. And it's one of the most difficult operations in the whole of cardiac surgery. It's not uncommon to have to do two valve operations at the one in the one patient. And the, the commonest combinations are aortic and mitral valve replacement. Some patients have got severe aortic and severe mitral regurgitation, which requires a valve replacement. Uh, it is also possible to have endocarditis that affects both valves. Uh, we, we often find in patients with mitral valve disease that they have tricuspid valve regurgitation due to the presence of pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular strain. And in that case, we would typically replace the mitral valve and repair the tricuspid valve. And there's a particular type of heart valve disease that we see in the carcinoid syndrome, where a patient has a, a neuroendocrine carcinoma, which is metastasized to the liver and is releasing 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin, and this causes uh, some sort of fibrous inflammation of the tricuspid and pulmonary valves, typically. So it's, that, that is actually the commonest operation when we have to operate on the heart for carcinoid syndrome, is to replace both the tricuspid and pulmonary valves.
So uh, Armand Preet and Emeka will talk about some of the clinical dilemmas that come up in practice. Mm -hmm. So we may get a phone call from a GP who's been checking the INR on someone with a mechanical heart valve and he phones in to say, my patient had a mitral valve replacement three years ago and the INR is currently 1.1. What should I do? What would you tell him? That's more like an emergency because uh, because of the situation that could arise from that. So it's absolutely dangerous for a um, patient that has a mechanical valve to have such a very low INR because of uh, the possibility of uh, thrombosis formation, uh, which could be lethal. Um, so um, patients should uh, be transferred to the um, hospital so that we will be able to um, first of all appropriately uh, warfarinize the patient and do an echocardiography to see if there's um, thrombosis uh, yes. already formed. Excellent and we would bring the patient in and yeah. put them on heparin until we got the INR back up to where yeah. it should be. Yeah. Of course it's not just a matter of valve thrombosis ca causing the valve disc to stick, it's also that even if the valve is working perfectly there can be embolism of the thrombotic the top, material. Yeah. So the, about 1% of patients with a mechanical heart valve will have a thromboembolic event each year. So that, that we generally go for an INR level of 1.8 and above. So if the INR is above 1.8 for a mechanical mitral valve, we're happy for them to be managed in the community. But if it's less than that, we generally advise to come into hospital and have heparin until we get it back in that range. For a mitral valve, the INR target range is slightly higher than the aortic valve mm -hmm. for a mechanical valve. So whereas for a mechanical valve, it would be 2 to 3. For a mitral valve, it would be 2.5 to 3.5. Is there a reason for that? Yes, there is, because the flow through the aortic valve is much more is much faster and more vigorous than the flow through a mitral valve. <clears throat> so thrombus can form more easily on a mitral valve than on an aortic valve. In, an, in addition, we also consider other factors apart from just the presence of the, that's the type of valve itself. Patients may have other comorbidities, like patients that have atrial fibrillation uh, and other factors that could um, lead to thrombus formation. So in those patients, we prefer a relatively higher um, INR than, than it, it, those it's, it's, At the present time, it's quite rare for us to go above 2.5 to 3.5. Yeah. We tend to just have two ranges, 2.0 to 3 or 2.5 to 3.5. Uh, but you're right, if someone we had a therapeutic INR and had a pulmonary embolism, we would, we would increase the range to three to four, but it's quite rare to have to do that. Similarly, if someone had um, a bleeding problem, if they're having hematuria or something, mm -hmm. and they were requiring blood transfusions, we might have to accept a lower INR. But then very recently, we also heard of that um, require, um, they are built in such a way that they, they have low thrombogenicity like onyx valves. That's right. So, so those onyx valves, um, you don't expect to, them to be at the same INR. You may tolerate a relatively lower INR in this patient than patients that have bileaflet um, valves. That's right. There's a new, a new mechanical valve that's also bileaflet mm -hmm. called onyx, and uh, they are promoting it as a low thrombogenicity valve. Mm -hmm. Um, it hasn't yet gained widespread ex acceptance because these other valves have been on the market for decades mm -hmm. and we know what their performance is at 30 or 40 years and it's going to take a long time for Onyx to, to reach those milestones. Mm -hmm. Onyx is the one which is uh, being tested out for uh, direct acting oral anticoagulants. Yeah, yeah, right. To see if um, it could replace roughly. Yeah, so it, that's that's the scenario with a GP phoning in with a mechanical mitral valve. Yeah. If it was a mechanical aortic valve, we would do exactly the same, except that we're happy if the INR is above 1.5 for an aortic mechanical valve. So a slight difference in the acceptable thresholds. Now, we may also have a patient who's coming in for surgery. Say they're coming in for uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm repair and they have a mechanical aortic valve. And the, the, the surgeon may write to you to say, please give me instructions about the pre and post operative management of warfarin in yeah. this patient. What would you say to him or her? Right, um, this is a very important scenario that's uh, not found uncommonly because um, patients on valve, you know, can, can also undergo surgery. Um, so what we do um, in this um, kind of uh, patients is that we will need to stop warfarin, uh, but 
we need to put them on heparin uh, we, because the patient must be anticoagulated. You can stop heparin like four hours to the surgery. So you could, but you cannot stop uh, the action of wolf. The action of wolfing, wolfing has to be stopped about five days. Five days. Yeah, the surgery. Most operatively, um, if we are not starting the wolfing, immediately we have to put uh, heparinize the patient uh, because of fear of thrombus formation. Some surgeons like to put them on uh, intravenous heparin, um, while some people put them on um, low, uh, what is it, low molecular weight. Uh, it will, is that, that is, of course, the textbook description of what we should do. We should yeah. put them on heparin yeah. uh, for, for uh, you stop the warfarin five days before the operation oh, yeah. and then bring them into hospital the day before surgery. You'll find the INR is quite low and then put them on heparin aiming for an APT ratio of 1.5 to 2.5 and then stop the heparin six hours before the operation. And, um, and and when would you restart anticoagulation after the aneurysm repair? We'll have to restart the um, anticoagulation when there's um, little or no risk of bleeding. When, was that, when would that generally be? Um, by the second day, post, uh, second day post-operatively, be aware of certain factors that could um, let us know that there's bleeding in the patient. If the drain output is not significant and we are sure of the hemiostasis, I think by the second day... And how would you restart the anticoagulation? I'm going to start um, heparin and warfarin at the same time because it takes about um, three days for what do you call the action of warfarin to start. So I'm going to start both and then stop heparin and continue warfarin when um, they um, have gotten a relatively good INR of about, let's say, 2 to 2.5. Is there any increased risk of bleeding if you're starting both heparin and warfarin at the same time? There's actually no increased risk of bleeding. The reason is because of the mechanism of action of warfarin. It takes about three days. You're not going to continue heparin and warfarin when warfarin has reached, when you've reached the, the, your target INR for warfarin. Yeah, warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist, yeah. so... And, and it takes about two or three days for the liver's production of vitamin K dependent clotting yeah. factors to fall away. Uh, until until then, there may still be circulating vitamin K and uh, dependent clotting factors that maintain the coagulation. Mm. So that that's an important area to think about: is the patient with a mechanical heart valve coming for surgery? Mm. Um, generally speaking, that we're, we're happy enough if the INR is above one point five for aortic valve and one point eight for mechanical valve. So we, you could stop the heparin when they reach those thresholds. In cardiac surgery, it's very different. We, we pay no attention to these guidelines yeah. because uh, we just tell the patient to stop warfarin, come into hospital, mm -hmm. have their operation done, and then we restart warfarin with DVT prophylaxis, delta parin dose for five days, yeah. and we just wait for the INR to come up. We don't give heparin. And that's because we're very comfortable dealing with cardiac problems right. and uh, going into the heart. You know, if there was any issue, we could just fix the, take the blood clot off the valve because we're operating on the heart anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, and I, I often just give those general, uh, it's the same for thoracic surgery, although we're yeah. not, not dealing with the, the heart at all right. because we're quite familiar with it and because we know that valve thrombosis is actually very rare. Uh, and it is relatively rare, even if the patient is not on warfarin. So uh, let's talk about some other issues. One of the things that can happen to prosthetic valves is they, they can become infected. So whenever we're having a patient with uh, needing a heart valve surgery, we, we do stress to them the need to have a dental checkup uh, once, or once, once a year at least, uh, because the same bacteria, strep viridans, that causes tooth decay can travel via the bloodstream to cause infection on a heart valve. And when it involves an artificial heart valve, we call that prosthetic valve endocarditis. And it's a very serious thing. The mortality is quite high if someone gets the prosthetic valve endocarditis. The chances of curing native valve endocarditis with antibiotics is about 90%, but uh, it's only about 50% with prosthetic valve endocarditis. So a lot of them end up requiring redo cardiac surgery and re-replacement of the valve. Why is it, sorry, um, hard to treat mechanical valve endocarditis? Well, the reason for that is that the bacteria get into that cloth sewing ring and the, the, it's a sanctuary site and there are lots of spaces. 
Antibiotics are only delivered to tissues that have a blood flow. So foreign material doesn't have a blood flow and they, they find that they can uh, hibernate in the fabric of the valve and uh, they just never get rid of the infection. Occasionally we have to put a patient on permanent lifelong antibiotics if they have a, a, a chronic endocarditis uh, that can sometimes hold the situation. So we, we're very uh, conscious about the need for dental checkups and we do advise our patients with a mechanical valve or a biological valve to have a dental prophylaxis when they, they go for surgery. So we advise them to have two grams of amoxicillin or if they're allergic, allergic to penicillin, 500 milligrams of erythromycin one hour before the invasive dental procedure. So it's really just for fillings or extractions that they require the antibiotic prophylaxis. Well, um, thank you very much, Armand Preet and Emeka, for joining me for this tutorial on heart valves. I hope that's been of some interest to you and to, the, you. to the viewers on the, on the film. Thank you.